morning, everybody. We're going to begin in just a moment. So if everybody can take their seats and uh, gather up their shmatas and, uh, and get ready for, uh, for a big day. Shmatas, the technical legal I was term. just wondering. It's going to lead to muffins for David. Welcome, everybody, to the Entertainment and Media Law Symposium for 2011. Uh, my name is Casey Chiswick. I'm a partner at Castles Brock and Blackwell. Danny Weber is blowing me kisses, and that's because I'm the, uh, the co-chair of the program, along with my friend Ron Hay from Stone Hay, Cafazo, Dembrowski, Richmond. That wasn't the right order, was it? That was it? good. It was, was pretty good? good. Okay, good. Over to you, Ron. Thanks, Casey. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many people here. It's amazing to see what mandatory uh, CPD can inspire. <laughs> it takes a lot of people to pull off an event like this, and I'm going to take the opportunity now um, to thank some of those people. Um, in addition to Casey and I, of course, we have a fantastic steering committee um, comprised of Susan Abramovich, Pina D'Agostino, David Steinberg, David Zitzerman, and new this year, uh, Jason Key, Chris Pang, and Danny Weber. Thanks. Um, you're going to see all of us um, in front of you sitting here um, uh, with muffins or otherwise uh, throughout the next couple of days. Um, but we just do the, uh, the easy stuff. The heavy lifting uh, is done by the Law Society staff. And I just wanted to thank, in particular, Helen Bernstein, Andrea Bojnik, Marie Shehan, and Alexandra Wong for all of their help. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think most people are familiar with the building. If you're not, um, this is where the major sessions are going to be. Coffee you found outside. Uh, washrooms are downstairs. Um, we're going to, there's, there's breaks throughout the sessions that are in the agenda, so um, you can follow along and, uh, and take, keep score. And I'm going to pass it back to Casey to set us up for the day. We have about 150 people attending the program this year, which I'm pretty sure is a new record. That includes uh, 27 people who are logging in by webcast. So. Hello to all there uh, out there in uh, Simultini land. Uh, we're glad to have you all here. And, and, um, and if you have any questions, by the way, about claiming the CPD credit for the program, uh, please don't ask me. But there are, uh, there are Law Society people all around who should be able to answer whatever questions you have. Uh, the program this year is, is following what we found to be a successful format in 2009. We'll start this morning with a, uh, a keynote address by our friend John Festinger. Uh, that'll be followed by, um, by a panel discussion of that paper. And both the, the, uh, the keynote and the panel discussion are designed to set the stage for the theme that, that, uh, that runs through the whole program, namely uh, Convergence 3.0. It's here and it's happening. Uh, more on that in a moment. This afternoon, um, we'll have a couple more plenary sessions followed by our second annual Entertainment and Media Law Boot Camp, which uh, consists of four uh, breakout workshop sessions with, uh, with expert facilitators in each case. And the concept is a, a hands-on look at various hot issues in entertainment and media law, including negotiating guides and precedents and really, you know, getting your your sleeves rolled up and your hands dirty to help uh, understand what's going on in, uh, in that world. You can attend two of those workshops. Don't plan to attend the same one twice because, you know, you really, really like format licensing. They're the same uh, seminar just running consecutively, so make sure to choose wisely and, and uh, capitalize on the opportunity to hear and learn more about different subjects. Um, a networking reception follows at the end of today, and tomorrow morning we shift our focus a little bit to a focus on interactive entertainment. Uh, Jason Key, our, our new uh, steering committee member from the Entertainment Software Association, um, has planned two excellent uh, programs on video game and, and interactive entertainment, including financing models and deal-making models. And that'll be followed by a great panel on user-generated content. So for all of you who uh, were thinking about sleeping in tomorrow morning, I don't recommend it. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll miss an opportunity to learn about something that's becoming really more and more important in our, in our practices. I, I missed oh, one thing. Ron forgot something. Just <laughs> 
very important because when you start listing people to thank and you forget somebody or two people, you, you regret it. Um, Casey and I uh, sort of inherited the co-chairship of this conference um, from our, our colleague or, and former colleagues, Peter Steinmetz and Stephen Stone, and just wanted to thank them so much for all of their efforts over the years to establish this as a really the preeminent uh, entertainment law conference in the country. And uh, Stephen's here, and I don't think Peter is. He's maybe uh, out in his deck or something like that. Anyway, Guaranteed. Guaranteed. thanks very much to both of them. So over to you again. All right, so Convergence 3.0, what does it mean? Uh, it's been a buzzword Convergence has in entertainment and media law since at least the late 1990s, and, and the year 2000 really brought the first major wave of horizontal convergence. Uh, AOL bought Time Warner, converging new media with old. Uh, CanWest bought Hollinger, converging conventional TV and newspapers. BCE bought CTV, and then part of the Globe and Mail, converging broadcasting with publishing and, and online and wireline communication. Quebec Corps bought Videotron, converging publishing and cable. And what we know is that some of those deals worked, most of them didn't. And there was a lot of speculation about why. Maybe they didn't understand each other's business models properly. Maybe they didn't have a, uh, a great idea of how to cross-platform the content that made those deals so attractive. But what we know is that by the end of that first decade of, of, of the 2000s, most of those deals had fallen apart and convergence had started to seem less like the wave of the future and more like a recipe for failure. Fast forward to today and the media landscape has changed again with convergence making a comeback. Um, the, the, uh, the second wave began in 2007 probably when Astro bought the standard broadcasting assets and then CTV bought Chum and then was forced to sell uh, the city TV stations to Rogers Media, creating a real multimedia conglomerate with conventional and specialty channels and radio stations and magazines to complement Rogers' uh, massive cable presence. And that really became a multifaceted, vertically converged um, uh, media, media empire. 2010 brought more, uh, more vertical convergence. BCE bought CTV Globe Media again to form Bell Media, which now owns the, uh, the CTV Network, 27 affiliate stations, six A-channel affiliates, 30 specialty TV channels, 33 radio stations, web properties, and, and a big chunk of the Globe and Mail. CanWest then sold its broadcasting assets to Shaw, rebranding them as Shaw Media, including uh, Global Television Network and a bunch of specialty channels. Quebec Corps continues to buy up uh, local and community papers and is about to launch Sun News next week. So we have Rogers Media, Bell Media, Shaw Media. It's not difficult to see what's happening in the Canadian media industry, and it seems that controlling distribution and content seems to be the latest wave of the future. So for the steering committee and for Ron and me, we thought that was the perfect way to frame our discussions over the next two days because the big question from our standpoint is what does this all mean for entertainment and media lawyers? What does it mean for our clients? What does it mean for our practices? And so this morning's uh, plenary and panel will explore the meaning of convergence, the convergence of companies, the convergence of industries, and the convergence of areas of the practice of law. Later on, we'll talk about practice management issues, including the conflicts of interest that convergence can create and how both lawyers and clients are trying to deal with them. And then when we shift focus to the, to the boot camp this afternoon, we'll be looking a lot at multi-platform deals and what happens when new media meets old law. And so that's the theme. We're going to be looking at the, the threads of convergence running through our practice and how the practice is changing as a result and how all of us can learn to adapt to what's going on to make ourselves better lawyers and more effective advocates and advisors for our clients. Now to set the stage for all that, because you know it's a, just a small topic, um, I want to introduce our morning keynote speaker, uh, Canada's King of Convergence. I just coined that right now, John. What do you think? Uh, John Festinger is, is a lawyer and a business executive and, and, uh, and respected, uh, respected greatly in both areas. 
He uh, began his legal career with the Vancouver firm of Owen Bird, leaving that partnership to become general counsel of WIC Communications. He was then a senior vice president with CTV, a general manager of the uh, Vancouver television uh, station. Um, and finally was executive uh, vice president, business and general counsel of the Vancouver Canucks and GM Place before recently forming uh, his own uh, law firm, uh, Festinger Banuwal Law and Strategy. He is a respected uh, uh, professor at UBC and the University of Victoria, the author of a leading text on video game law, and I understand that the next edition of that book is uh, just about ready uh, to be published, and we're very happy that he's joined us today from Vancouver to talk about the three faces of convergence. So without further ado, please welcome John Festinger. This is uh, my first ever PowerPoint presentation, despite all of my executive experience. Is it fair to assume that I just have to hit enter? Yes, okay. Um, it's an honor, um, it really is, and a, and a pleasure to be here um, today. It's been a long time since I've been at a Law Society of Upper Canada conference. I, I used to be a regular speaker. Um, so this is a bit of a reintroduction uh, for me after my wanderings. On the uh, flight out here, I took the red eye on Wednesday night. Um, and about a minute and a half after the flight took off, so we were in the air, there was a blinding and rather otherworldly flash of light. And no real sound, but the entire plane was engulfed in light, had no idea what happened. It was about, you know, a split second. Turned to the person sitting next to me and she said, oh, I think some of the light bulbs must have blown out. Okay, about five to ten minutes later, the captain comes on and says, uh, you may have noticed we were hit by lightning, but really this is no problem at all. Planes are often hit by lightning, don't worry, we've, we've done uh, a full check of all of our systems and we're good to go to Toronto. And just about that time, maybe a minute and a half later, the plane starts bumping and jumping and falling and rising seemingly uncontrollably for the next three hours <laughs> until we're just outside of Toronto. And I probably, like all of you, have watched enough movies where planes have been struck by lightning and nothing good comes of it, that I am thinking, okay, this really is it. I may not see my family, I may not see my wife, I may not see my kids again. And this other thought keeps creeping into my head. Gee, this is a really good metaphor for the talk I have to give on Friday morning. And I'm thinking, th and I swear, I, sort of, I'm outside my body going, you are really sick to even think of that. Um, but con now that I'm safely on the ground and alive, um, I, I, I'm not sure I was entirely wrong in those moments of panic. Um, there, is, um, there is something about digital media. I'm gonna stay away from the term new media uh, quite consciously, um, there is something about digital media that is like lightning striking, and the game is really changing. And that's what I want to try and address as constructively as I can um, this morning. Um, 
before I go on, I, I do really want to thank Gary Mavara, who's not here, and whose place I really am taking. Originally, he was going to give uh, this talk, and the paper uh, uh, and the presentation, um, certainly the paper has a lot of him in it, uh, and you'll recognize the parts of it that are me, because that's probably most of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, just briefly, um, since I am returning, uh, in a sense, to this, to this uh, dais, um, after wandering in the wilderness for the last number of years um, and not being easily identified as a media and entertainment lawyer because I've been doing all sorts of different things, um, I just want to recap very quickly um, a couple of things uh, that I've learned that may be formative uh, in what I'm saying. Um, my, tele my, my television experience running a television station um, was an extremely powerful experience because everything that made me a good lawyer made me a terrible, terrible manager. And, um, and I, I felt every day during the first year of that experience that I was going to be fired and more importantly that I deserved to be fired. Um, that's a talk unto itself, um, but the, r the real point of the experience was that I started to open my eyes to what other people other than lawyers really did and, um, and to how creativity really works. And not that I was creative, but understanding that I think helped um, some of these other things. Um, after that experience, I, I, I nominally did come back to practice law, but I was really interested in the video game world. Um, and the reason I was interested is because I had noticed over the arc of my career um, that you follow the talent. And when I started in broadcasting, uh, in the early, as a broadcast lawyer in the early 80s, there was a transition going on where a lot of really talented people were in radio, but the younger talented people who were coming up were all going into television. Um, and then I noticed a form of that transition again when I was at VTV, um, and I noticed that the really clever kids coming out of university were going into digital uh, media, and a lot of them were going into video gaming. Then I had the incredible privilege, and, and I know that it's a lot of people's um, fantasies, um, and, and certainly uh, any Montreal uh, boy uh, like I am, um, working for an NHL team is uh, a dream come true, and it really was. Um, from the perspective of what we're talking about today, um, sports was amazing because you live in a non-fragmented world. Certainly, if you're doing hockey in Canada, you have a monopoly. Um, and sports content, it seems, precisely because it's live, precisely because it's so compelling, um, and, and maybe I'm just talking about hockey, um, we were really living, we are living in a bit of a bubble. As there's more and more choice, simple choices uh, like sports seem easier and easier to make. Um, and then the last piece of that puzzle is that um, when I was at the Canucks, uh, and, and really completely because of the people around me, um, we had we were the number one website in the NHL. And if you think about it, um, Vancouver does not have the demographics that warrant it being the number one website in the NHL and about the number six professional sports website, uh, professional sports team website in North America um, uh, by certain measures. Um, and the way we did that was we 
uh, we converged. We took a web group that was part of marketing and a broadcast group that was on its own, uh, put them together, and the result was uh, didn't change the broadcast group as much, and again, this is a metaphor um, in a way. It, we quadrupled the amount of video that we were sending out on Canucks.com just at the time that video on the web was becoming hot, and success flowed from there. Now I'm going to whip through um, a bunch of uh, thoughts that uh, you will see reflected in the paper that you have in your materials. Um, we always talk about convergence, uh, business reality is what you see on the slide. Um, we, especially in Canada, represent very small companies and the market caps of relatively new players and uh, digital media players uh, are dwarfing us. Where is this growth coming from? Um, it's coming from mobile. It's coming from on demand. And time shifting services are growing dramatically. I'm sorry if I'm going quickly, but I want to stay within time, and there's a lot of material here. And increasingly, we talk about OTT, over the top, which really means bypassing the conventional broadcasting system. And the one, um, the, sorry, of course. Apparently, I'm not fully converged yet. This Ah. Okay. All right. My apologies. Apparently, I turn away from the mic too much, and in in the the new digital world, we have to be more stationary. Um, <laughs> the one piece uh, I've recently in my um, in my coming back to uh, to practice. Um, uh, I decided to buy an iPhone, and the iPhone turned me into an Apple aficionado, so I now uh, haunt all these sort of Apple rumor sites at 2 a.m. Um, and the latest rumor is that uh, Apple is going to be introducing what I'll call the real Apple TV, which is uh, actually a hardware device that looks like a television set in your living room that's fully integrated with iTunes and other things. And it is the full embodiment of over the top. Um, and it doesn't, I mean, obviously there will be ways of connecting television to it, but it is not designed to be or intended to be a television device. Um, and uh, I'll just invite you to look at the definition of broadcasting uh, in the Broadcasting Act uh, and think about it in terms of jurisdiction. Broadcasting is in part defined as, uh, what, as, as uh, what you get uh, and it's limited by being what you get over a broadcasting receiving apparatus. And then when you go to the definition of broadcasting receiving apparatus, it defines it essentially as that which receives broadcasting. So it's a completely circuitous um, piece and, um, and something like the new or the real Apple TV um, might, uh, might well be completely beyond the jurisdiction of the commission, not just um, an area where the commission is choosing not um, uh, to intervene, which is the, the current case um, in many of these discussions. So um, I have to see where all of this starts going.
this to me, um, from what I'm seeing, is, is really uh, the key slide, um, or a key slide. Um, and that is that more and more um, you are seeing the social aspect of media as a layer, um, as something on top of, and sometimes and often these days as the media itself. So why? Why is this? And forgive the petty psychologizing uh, on my part. Um, it's the integration of content and contact. Um, and increasingly, and I'm working with one company right now, um, I think increasingly you can expect uh, games that are rather unsophisticated, uh, like Farmville, for example, but hugely successful, to get more and more sophisticated layers in terms of graphics, in terms of game design, um, uh, in, in terms of the experience uh, that people are going to have. Um, and, and most importantly, in the integration of the social aspect in, into gaming. Um, my paradigm shifter. Um, pardon some of these words, they, they are chosen carefully, uh, was a game called uh, Grand Prix Legends, um, which I could regale you with for hours, but um, I, it was the first time I played online, and it's a racing game, and it was probably 1999 or 2000, um, and I was playing online with people from around the world on one um, Formula One grid. It's, it's a game that replicated the 1967 uh, Formula One season. Um, and my world just shifted when I realized that I was actually um, online with these people who I sort of knew from the Grand Prix Legends forums, which I haunted at the time, and the whole kind of the, the, the social aspect joined with the media aspect in a way that I had never experienced before. Um, a couple of months ago, um, my son had, as part of his, he's, he's now in grade nine, <laughs> as part of a, a grade eight trip, he went to Israel and stayed with a family. Um, part of his grade eight trip with his high school. And he made friends, obviously, with uh, his opposite number, a, a boy his age. Um, and about a month and a half ago, um, I was on my computer by the media room. He was in the media room, and he was playing Xbox, as he does far too much, as all teenage boys do far too much. And I heard a voice with an accent come through the headset, and I said, who's that? And he said, oh, that's my friend in Israel. And they were playing, um, uh, they were playing some first-person shooter that they were both too young to actually be playing. Um, and I said, how did that happen? And he said, oh, we were on Facebook, and he just got the game, and he wanted to play it. And, and they, were, they were playing it multiplayer. Um, and hence the headline, because I remember in my youth when I went away and I made friends with someone, being a typical male, I never saw them again. Girls would write letters, boys just did nothing. Those relationships went away. So my headline for that is long distance teenage male friendship now possible, <laughs> thanks to the Xbox. Um, so how does this all work? Um, the petty psychologizing is content and contact. Uh, equals a shared context. And if you think about it, meaning comes from shared context, and there's tons and tons of studies now that show that what makes people really happy is each other. So the power of the social part of the network and the social part of media should not be underestimated. Now, I am 
going to rely on somebody, probably David, to start warning me if I'm uh, uh, starting to run over. Uh, okay, I'll watch Casey. Um, so, fairly quickly, um, just want to review the elements and attributes of digital media. You all know this, so um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, but it's a good review to where I want to take this. Um, bits are easily copied, um, and every copy is as good as the first one. Um, oh, I have to go through all four copies. Um, ease of transmission and multiple use. The point here is that broadcasting regula regulation was based on scarcity of spectrum originally. There is no scarcity, and increasingly, as we know, there are no borders that are easily enforced in a world of digital media, especially over-the-top digital media. This is, uh, I don't know if this is Gary's word, but I saw it for the first time from, from Gary Mavara. Um, digital media is plastic. Um, and that just means it can be easily manipulated, adapted, corrected, realigned, reinterpreted. In the gaming world, um, an area that I've done a lot of work in, which I, I won't trouble you with now, and thought a lot about, is um, the world of mods. Um, and some of you may know there's a base game, and uh, a group of 16-year-old kids will basically hack it and build levels onto it. Sometimes they're permitted by the developer to do so. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're legally uh, not allowed to do it but are really encouraged to do it by the developer. So there's all sorts of different relationships, um, and it's a, it's a fascinating area. Um, digital media is incredibly compact, um, and, and space is becoming cheaper and cheaper. Um, now we start getting a little bit into the meat of it. Because of the attributes that I just talked about, um, what used to be the situation in media, which was you had a medium, and then you had content that really could only be on that medium. And if you were going to move it to another medium, you had to very significantly change the content. You know, newspaper content just didn't look good on television. You had to produce television as television. Um, what we're starting to see, um, more than starting to see, is, is, is because of the plasticity of digital media that all of these mediums, which were once so separate and so different, are merging and converging, as you well know. And where things start getting difficult is where you were regulating some of these mediums and not others previously. And, um, and, 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 and what do you do? So um, even in a fully non-regulated environment, there are different approaches. Um, for example, Apple has a walled garden which may require you to repurchase the same piece of content um, in different ways for different devices. Um, just the other day, I read about something called the Ultraviolet Consortium, which is led by Microsoft and Hewlett Packard and, and, and the rest of the expected players. And they want uh, to create a system where you as a consumer buy the content once and it's usable across all mediums. Which, as, as the paper uh, in your material says, is probably where this needs uh, to end up. Now, a brief wor word about the old world. Um, 
This is what the television value chain looked like in 1975. This is what it looks like today. The point is uh, not, as, as David is desperately trying to decipher through where all the lines are going, is not really to do that except in the materials, um, but to acknowledge the complexity. Um, and then you layer on to this um, what's happening, that all of this is, is affecting the world of marketing. <coughs> and what you get is massive complexity. So massive complexity for consumers, but massive complexity for anybody who wants to reach consumers. Um, some of it is regulated, some of it is unregulated. For years in my law school class at UBC, um, I would start the first class by putting nine boxes on the blackboard. And then I would put a wire to each box and I would, and I would ask the students to pick their favorite bit of content, some movie or, or whatever it was, say it was Field of Dreams to stay with the sports theme. And then I would ask them to imagine that each of those boxes was playing Field of Dreams simultaneously but one of them was delivered over the air, one of them was delivered by cable, one of them was delivered over a computer, et cetera, et cetera. I had nine different permutations, um, some of which were regulated, some of which were unregulated, which led to the obvious question, um, why should some of them be regulated, why, why should the, some of them not be, and then my explanation that that was the core of the course that they were about to sit in on on the rest of the year. I realized when I saw this, because Gary Mavara drew this up, that my nine television screens has now become that nightmare up there. So, part of this, um, Casey, have I got, what have I got? Keep going? All right. Um, when I was asked to do this, um, What I, I really felt like I was outside this group that I had once um, loved and been a part of, and and I, but but I had the privilege of being outside and not being a day-to-day -day CRTC lawyer and regulatory lawyer anymore, um, and all immersed. And I said, okay, what have I? I, I did actually say to myself, what have I learned and what does all this stuff mean? Um, and the question that formed, and, and really the first paragraph, is simply a reiteration of all the things, all the previous slides. In this new mobile, on-demand, OTT, socially networked world of digital media, which is easily co copied, easily transmitted, without scarcity or borders, simply, simple to manipulate, incredibly compact, and which can be created by almost anyone. We haven't spent a lot of time on that, but I know a lot of this conference will. What do we need to do for made in, content, made in Canada content to survive and thrive? That was my old passion. My old passion, certainly when I was general counsel of Western and, uh, and beyond that, was Canadian creative content. And uh, how do we remove impediments uh, to that creativity? And it seemed to me that that question has become much more urgent in that world because the protections that we can afford Canadian creativity um, are less. The opportunities arguably are more. Um, and how do we regulate, what sort of public policy perspective should we take uh, on this area? So a brief interlude. Um, I started thinking a little bit historically, and I realized um, 
that there have been shifts in media, huge shifts before. Digital media is, the not, is not the first revolution. Uh, I think we, I hope we can all agree it is a revolution. But there have been previous revolutions and what's, what, what perhaps is possible to do is to identify a certain uh, approach at how, um, how content and carriage should be regulated and was regulated with particular media. Um, and I've coined a few phrases here, but I'll take you through the history. Um, most people don't know that the printing press was regulated in England. And in fact, John Milton's very famous uh, book, Areopagitica, which to me still s stands as the best piece on freedom of expression, uh, has every freedom of speech argument uh, that's never been made better, um, uh, in my view, uh, is still in Areopagitica. That was a speech to the British Parliament against the licensing of printing presses. An unsuccessful speech, by the way, uh, because printing presses were regulated uh, by a CRTC-like body for about 50 years after Areopagitica. Um, the, without getting into it, if you look at the era, you'll realize that the reason the printing press was uh, regulated was because of the fear of the underclass, the fear of the rabble, the fear of what happens if we democratize um, books and what sort of crazy ideas will get into people's heads and what governments will be uh, thrown over. So it was a, what I'll call a paternalistic, uh, very, pater very paternalistic regime in terms of looking at uh, content and carriage. Then came radio, um, and I include this quote because um, I learned something which I will share for, with you. Uh, so this is uh, 1932, the Prime Minister, this country must be assured of complete Canadian control of broadcasting from Canadian sources. Without such control, broadcasting can never be the agency by which national consciousness may be fostered and sustained and national unity still further strengthened. So a very nationalistic regime. About 10 years ago, uh, I was doing an in-house seminar at a law firm um, where um, I was talking about the origins of broadcasting policy, and I included this quote. And one of my colleagues, uh, the very uh, bright, able uh, international lawyer, uh, she, was, uh, she was German, she had come over, uh, uh, I think with a German law degree, and had been practicing in Canada for about 10 years. Um, and she was in the seminar, I read this quote, and uh, trying to explain the origins of, of broadcasting policy, and she went white. She went sheet white. And I said, uh, um, I think her name was Ulrika, Ulrika, what's wrong? Are you okay? And she stammered, which she does not do, and she said, you, do you realize what that is? And I said, no. She said, what year is that quote from? I said, 1932. And as I said 1932, I realized what I was saying. She said, that was the credo of National Socialism. That, and, and this is not an attack on the Prime Minister. You have to think about the geopolitical state of the world at the time and realize that you know National Socialism, which we obviously and rightly um, uh, decry as, as, as a gross evil on humanity, at the time had a fair bit of, of following, and it's not entirely beyond understanding how it could have creeped into our public policy discussion and how some of the rhetoric could have. So I, I 
I, I just say that mo mostly as a point of interest. I've never known really what to do with that um, other than uh, it's a good anecdote for a, for a talk like this. Television. Um, Kaplan, look at Kaplan's television in 1986. Uh, I know it's not a word, but I've coined culturalistic to try and be, uh, to try and standardize it. Um, and I think if you read that report, you'll see it was all about Canadian culture. So we transitioned from paternalism to nationalism to culturalism. Ten minutes, I can do that, Casey. Thank you. Um, and then we come to cable. And there's a very important thing that happens between three and four, and, and, and Ken will remember it well, um, and that's the Free Trade Act. And, the, and, 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 and where we were with respect to North American, or Amer you know, with respect to free trade worldwide, and in North America, and with Mexico, and what a big part of the public debate uh, that became. And there were, there is a cultural exemption that was carved out in free trade legislation, but nobody felt really good about it. I shouldn't say nobody felt really good about it, but generally the, it, 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 it was contrary to the, you know, the, the overall prevailing direction. You're saying free trade, but not for this. And, and it, it, it was really imperfect. And I think we increasingly said, look, we have to find a way to make our industrial base viable. And um, in the mid-90s, the, probably the best embodiment of that, in my mind, was something called the Information Highway Advisory Council. Um, and the paradigms that, that, that were espoused out of there were what I'll coin as industrialistic. So the point that I'm trying to make is that previous revolutions have had policy paradigms that applied to them. And the question that I humbly put in front of you is, shouldn't this one, shouldn't the digital revolution have its own policy paradigm? Should we really be pouring new wine into old bottles? And that's the reference to the Luddites. Um, does it really work to try and, and many will argue, hey, let's just adapt what we have. You know, we can shave a little off here, we can add a little here, uh, we can adjust. And the question before all of us is, can we, really? Is this incremental? Is this evolutionary? Or is do we have enough signs among all the different things that we've talked about so far to say, no, this is truly different, and we need to figure out what we're going to do with it in a public policy sense? So, and one other quick and perhaps all too personal point. Um, What I've learned, and the whole reason for the beginning of this spiel, um, what I've learned in the course of my career is that the creators really are terrific. And I know we all talk about that because we're their lawyers and we want our clients to be happy. Um, but they just want to create. And if you create, if you, if you can remove impediments and allow an environment where creators can really create, um, it is not lip service to say that ours are world class. Um, uh, if, if we remove the boundaries, um, we will get magic. And when we have removed boundaries, uh, we have gotten magic. So the answer seemed obvious to me. 
new policy filter for the new world of digital, do only what will result in the most compelling Canadian creative content. Two steps, and, and obviously there's further papers that I want to write on this, and this is just the beginning. Uh, what impediments to Canadian creativity must be removed? Secondly, what measures must actively be taken to encourage the most compelling Canadian creative product? We don't really have time to do anything else. In the paper, in your materials, you'll find some suggestions. What, in, in this formulation, hopefully this gives everybody enough, uh, at least a starting point. The only goal here is to perhaps create a starting point where everybody can engage in the debate, at least acknowledge that it's a new debate. Every, every player is going to have their own perspective on how to answer those questions. And those perspectives will conflict. So the suggestions that follow uh, tend to come a bit more from a broadcasting perspective, but um, I'm not going to go into them. They are in the paper, and they are, um, uh, they are simply one set of perspectives that Gary, Lavara, and I share. Uh, there's, there's a little bit more explanation in the paper, and I do want to drive you to the paper. And also, there's a panel that's, that's coming up. Um, what I really was trying to get at is the filter. Now, I want to end on two thoughts. One about content and one about you. Um, the content thought is my experience, for whatever it's worth, it always comes back to supporting the creation of content. Content supports the distribution mechanisms, and that's why it all works. And nothing, and at no time does that principle seem as urgently important as it does now, at least to me. The second is uh, a conversation that happened between my wife. Uh, who's the M, standing for mom, and my daughter, who's the A, standing for, for April, and um, she's nine years old, and I was downstairs on the computer, and April said, what's daddy doing? And Corinne, my wife, said he's playing with his technology, and April, in one of those moments where a child is wise beyond her years, said, it may be technology, trying to be clever, but it's not knowledge. You're the knowledge. Um, that's where the members of the bar come in. That's where we as lawyers come in. These are not simple questions. Um, if you accept that the world really is changing, then your clients need you now more than ever. Thank you for listening. Thanks, John. That was terrific, and I think it really sets the stage for uh, the discussion that's about to follow. We'll take a quick um, coffee break, coming back at 10.15, uh, Ron, is that right? 10.15 for a panel uh, led by David Zitzerman discussing some of the concepts that John just, uh, just uh, presented to us for the first time. Be right back in 15 minutes.